Thank you for tuning in to RTM Nation Online, where we believe that you will receive the abundance of peace, prosperity, security, stability, health, healing, and truth. If you would like to learn more about the ministry, click the link below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Now let's get into the message. So I'm extremely excited. I'm excited. I'm excited about what God has done. I'm excited about what he's doing. Amen. So um, I started, started working on this, the, the message that, it, that we'll share with you today. Um, and uh, it was good. It was, it was really good. And I, I felt led to share it with um, our senior pastor, Pastor Brian. And I, so I sent it to him and he looked at it and said, man, I, that, that's a good word right there. That sounds like Wednesday's message. You mean Wednesday, last Wednesday. I was preparing it for today and ended up teaching it Wednesday at our Tampa campus. And, um, but I was like, man, I got to bring it back. No, we just got to bring it back. So, so today we're going to speak from the message title, Uncommon Faith. Yeah. Uncommon Faith. And we're in between uh, message series. We just um, concluded the Art of War. Art of War. And uh, we're transitioning into a new series. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. in the meantime, let's talk about faith. And, and I'm so honored. Um, it's like honor on top of honor because I'm honored at the opportunity to teach and to share God's word. But then on top of that, I'm honored at the opportunity to teach on the topic of faith. So many great men and women of God have talked to us from the topic of faith. And they have said things that have set the foundation for the life that we live. Amen or amen. amen. And I'm grateful um, that God has shared something with me concerning the subject of faith. And I get to share it with you. And I believe that it is a life changing message. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how many of you actually came here to have your life change. I don't know. Maybe it's just one person. Maybe just one person came to have a life change, and that would be okay with me, because I show up every day to have my life changed too. Amen. Yeah. Hey, man. Amen. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why some people come to church. I don't know no more. I thought I used to know, but I don't know why people do what they do no more. Right? I mean, you you know, you, there could be several reasons why you came, got up, got dressed, and came here to this campus. You came, maybe you just came to see what was going to happen. I don't know. Maybe you came to see somebody new. I don't know. Maybe you came to get some, uh, some snacks in the foyer. <laughs> I don't know. But for those of you that came to receive a word from God, that's what I came to deliver. Amen. 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 And I believe it's going to be a life-changing word. I believe it's, um, you know, like every message, but I put an exclamation point behind this one. I believe that this is a message that you can, this is one that you, that you want to live by. Wherever you put that stuff that's essential for your life, wherever you keep that type of information, this is a place where you want to, I think this is something that you need to add like in that category of life essentials. This is something to live by. Amen. Amen. You ready for it? All right, you got your notebooks? Yeah. Okay, here we go. We're going in. You think they're ready? You don't know? I don't either. <laughs> That's why I ain't started yet, because I don't think they're really ready yet. And I understand that. Sometimes, you know, you got to spend time just, you know, you come into a church service, you come, you sit down, and then when it's time for the teacher to teach, you know, you're pulling pe peppermints out of your purse and you got to find that good pen. The first pen you found didn't write well, so now you're searching for another pen and you got to take a minute just to get yourself together. That's what all the introductory stuff is for, right? I understand that. So I just want to give you that space and that time to get your mind right. You ready? Yes. You know, there's an awesome dynamic to this, to, to this, this uh, teaching thing. Well, I believe that, you know, a good teacher, somebody who's called to it, like, I can, I can feel where y'all are at. Like, I mean, I can tell when you ain't ready. Yeah. I can tell when you came and your mind is somewhere else and you just here in the body. I can feel that, right? 
So right now I'm feeling, I'm like, I'm like, I know what's in this iPad. I know what's on this page right here. And I know how life changing it can be. And right now I'm just filling you out to see if you're ready to receive that type of word. Amen. Okay. Y'all feel a little more ready now. God. Mm. Glory to God. You ready? Yes. Amen. Uncommon faith. The purpose of this message, the purpose of this message, this message, listen, this message was composed and put together for you to get it. Not the message, but to get it. Whatever your it is, this the message. This message was put together for you to get it. Let that sink for a little bit. Like, this is it right here. This is that word. This is the message. This is the message. The purpose of this message is for you to get it. And I don't know about you, but in my you know, Christian life, I met many people, many people that say that they're using their faith to get it, whatever their it is. And um, I'm going to tell you the answer to the question, the answer to the test right here in the beginning. I'm going to give you the answer. Listen, if you're still living this life, if you're living your saved life and you're looking beyond yourself, you're looking outside of yourself for an it. If you're looking for whether it be satisfaction or fulfillment, if the it that you're looking for is outside of yourself. Then you still don't get it. You still don't get it. If you're looking for something beyond you, your saved self, your Holy Spirit housing self, if you're looking for something beyond you in order to find fulfillment, in order to find completion, in order to find whatever it is your it is, if you're searching beyond yourself, then you still don't get it. The reason you ain't got it is because you don't get it. <laughs> All right. Amen. Amen. Reason you ain't got it yet is because you don't get it. But by the end of this message, you're going to get it. Amen. Glory to God. Because you're going to realize you already got it. That's right. You ready? Yes. Man. So I had to ask myself the question, why uncommon faith? Why well, title it Uncommon Faith? And here's the answer to that question. If the, when, when common faith isn't getting the job done, then you need uncommon faith. Common faith being if, when the faith that you've been using, when the faith around you isn't getting the job done, then you need an uncommon faith. An uncommon faith. Now, now I know, that, you know, a lot of what I'll say kind of, you know, will, will rub your, your traditional thinking uh, the right way or the wrong way. But that's what's necessary in order for you to get the message. OK, listen, whenever you realize that the common faith, your common faith isn't getting the job done, you need an uncommon faith. One thing you have to understand is that there is there was. The Bible, Jesus identified a faith that was uncommon. Jesus identified faith that was common, faith that was plenty. This faith is like all around me. And then there are moments when Jesus identified an uncommon faith. And for those of you that are familiar with your Bible, even a little bit, you know, even if you spent some time in Sunday school, you've heard the stories. There are three people in the Bible where Jesus said this. These people have uncommon faith. This is an uncommon faith. This is this is his, his response was, I haven't seen this type of faith in all of Israel. This is an uncommon faith. If there's an uncommon faith, then there's got to be a common faith. And the truth is, the comparison that he's making is that common faith is not getting the job done. But this uncommon faith, this is it right here. So I want to be in that category of people that just have that uncommon faith. I want to find out those people that Jesus pointed out. I mean, if you're a star student with Jesus, 
I want to be in the star student club with Jesus, right? So what is it that these folks had that had that 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 allowed them to wear that title for all of history, allowed them to be remembered for the rest of history as people with uncommon faith? There's three of them. One was the centurion. A centurion is a title for a soldier. He was a captain of hundreds. Centurion. Right. Centurion had uncommon faith. Remember the wish the woman with the issue of blood. Yeah. Jesus words to her was you have uncommon faith. I haven't seen this type of faith in all of Israel. Great is your faith. The Seraphonician woman. Seraphonician woman had uncommon faith. The centurion. And this is what's so powerful about this account. Here this man is. He's not Jew. He's not a Jew. He's not Jewish. Okay. He never even saw Jesus face to face. That whole account of the healing that was received for his servant, he never even had a face to face talk with Jesus. Ain't that something? This man had a servant who was sick. The Bible says that he favored this servant. He had heard about Jesus. He wanted his servant healed. So he sent representation He got some Jews and sent them to go and ask Jesus to come and heal his servant. So the man didn't even see Jesus face to face. Right. The the Jews that he sent made it to Jesus. The man felt that he was unworthy even to stand before Jesus. Very humble. The man felt that he was even unworthy to even have Jesus come under his roof. And he made the he said these words. These are the words that he said. He said, you know what? I'm a man of authority. I understand how this thing works. I speak my word and people respond to the word that I speak. If I tell soldiers to come, they come. If I use my words and tell soldiers to go, they go. I understand authority as a man of authority. And I know you to be, Jesus, a man of authority. So you don't even have to come to my house if you would just speak the word. Jesus heard that and said, my goodness, this is great faith. This is great faith. The Seraphonician woman, the Seraphonician woman wasn't a Jew. She came to Jesus because her daughter was sick. Jesus, Jesus basically said healing is the children's bread. And the latest response was, listen, you ain't even got to give me the whole thing. Just give me a crumb and it'll get the job done. Jesus responds to her. Great is your faith. The woman, there was a woman that suffered with an issue of blood for 12 years. Her issue was blood. I don't know what your issue is. She had an issue. We got issues. The point of the story is God deals with issues. That's encouraging to me. Yeah. Right. So she got this issue she's been dealing with for 12 years. She leaves her house. She hears about Jesus. She pushes through the crowd. One of the descriptions says she crawls through the crowd. She pushes past everybody because she had said within herself, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. And she does that. She follows through with what she said she was going to do. Pushes through that crab, crowd, grabs the, the edge of his robe and she's healed. Right. Jesus asked the question, who touched me? Now, he says, no, I know somebody touched me. Virtue left out of me. And the lady finds herself face to face with the master himself. And she's given a few minutes to tell her whole story. The Bible says she got a chance to tell the whole story. At the end of the story, Jesus says to her and to those that are witnesses, this is great faith. Hadn't seen faith like this in all of Israel. What is it that these people had in common? What is it that the centurion, the Seraphonician, and the woman with the issue, what is it that they had in common? One of the things they had in common was they were all non-Jews. They weren't Jewish. They were what we would call, what was called, what is called Gentiles. Gentile meaning that you're just not a Jew, right? What's significant about that? They didn't have a law. They didn't have rules. 
They weren't familiar with the customs. They weren't familiar. They didn't know the church stuff. They didn't know the church lingo. They didn't know step one, step two, step three. They didn't know that I can't talk to Jesus. They didn't know that they were. They didn't know all of that stuff. All they knew was Jesus is the answer that I need. There was nothing to buffer them. There was nothing in between them and Jesus. They didn't have Jesus and good behavior. They didn't have Jesus and I fulfilled the law. They didn't have Jesus and I gave a sacrifice. All they had was Jesus. That was the foundation of their faith. It was just Jesus. And that's something that we need to be sure that we're getting back to. Where it's just Jesus. What made their faith so great? They had Jesus and nothing else. It wasn't Jesus and good works. Remember the rich young ruler? The rich young ruler came to Jesus with his good works accompanying him. And he walked away not having received what he wanted. Why? Because he brought good works with him. He thought he was going to get some credit for the things that he did. Right? It wasn't Jesus and tradition. Like the Pharisees, Jesus had a bunch of conversation with the Pharisees saying, you know, what's, you know what your problem is? Your traditions get in the way. Yeah. Your tradition makes the word of God, makes the word of God a non effect. Amen. Right. These three people didn't have Jesus and tradition. It was Jesus, Jesus and just Jesus. Amen. Their faith pointed to Jesus and nothing else. It wasn't Jesus and, and church attendance. It wasn't Jesus and my name is on a roll. No, it was just Jesus. Oh, glory. That's good news right there. That's good news. I'm going to show you why it's good news. The lady with the issue of blood had exhausted all other options. She had been to the doctors, been to many doctors. The Bible says that she used all her resources on the doctors and she was still left in the same place. Right? Faith always points back to Jesus. Faith always points back to Jesus. So the question is, what is your faith pointing to? What is your faith pointing to? Does your faith point back to Jesus? See, what's become common, we talk about common faith, what's become common is that we have, there are many other things that people point their faith to. There are many other things that people, if we were to investigate, evaluate our, our, our lives, there are many other things that people point their faith towards. For example, I'll give you some examples. So what's become common is people who put their faith in their ability to demonstrate faith. I'll rewind that one for you. What's become common is that there are many people who put their trust, their reliance their, 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 their right to whatever it is that they say they believe in God for is really founded on their ability to, de to demonstrate why they are worthy of receiving what they believe God for. There's a lot of people who put faith in faith and say it like that. There's many people who put faith in faith. Let me give you some examples. You know, I got a right to it. I got a right to believe what I got a right to receive what I'm believing God for because, man, I fasted last week. No, man, I did a straight water fast last week. And since I fasted, I got a right to whatever it is that I'm believing God for. All right? But where's their faith pointing back to? To what they did. Or I waited. I've been waiting and waiting and waiting. I know the Bible tells me to wait, right? You got to wait on the Lord. So I've been waiting and waiting and waiting. And shoot, by now I just qualify because I don't wait it long enough. I haven't seen other people get their blessing. I know I'm in this line somewhere. I must be next. So I get a right to it. I got a right to whatever it is that I'm believing God for because I've waited. I waited, Lord. Right? Your faith just pointing back to what you do. Or, or even I prayed. I prayed about this. I prayed. I prayed. And nothing, I mean, we, prayer has a place. 
But are you relying on your works? Are you relying on your effort? Are you relying on what you've done? Where is your faith pointing back to? I'm going to help you out. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to give you, make it real, real plain. But we have, to, we have to be sure that our faith is pointed in the right direction. And this is one that's become real common. You know, I sold for it. Oh, shoot. I know that somebody felt that one. I sold for it. I got a right to it because I sold for it. I got a right to harvest because of the seed that I sowed. Now, what are you really saying? You're really saying is that your faith is secured by you, what you did, your sowing. Is that what gives you right to what God has for you? Ooh, shoot. I know I'm all up in it. God, dog. Is that what your faith is, is, is resting on? You got a right to it because you sold for it? And this is my thing. This is why this, this message is so, so important to me. The reason this message is so important to me is because, listen, if, you, if we say that we're living according to God's way, God's way is universal. If we say we're living according to God's law, God's way of doing things, then the way that you live in should be able to be applied by anybody in any country, in any state, in any position. And all of us should be getting the same results. But if you say that you're doing something and you get certain results from what you say you're doing and other people do it and they don't get the same results, then. That's not universal. God's way is universal. God's kingdom is universal. What do I mean by that? God's way works for everybody, anybody. God doesn't discriminate. God says, I'm no respecter of persons. You apply, you, you respond to Jesus in Africa. You get results from responding to Jesus in Africa. You respond to Jesus in America. It that doesn't matter. God is God everywhere. He is right. He's God everywhere. Anybody who responds to Jesus, wherever you are, whoever you are, you should get the same results mm -hmm. Amen. if you're responding to Jesus. It doesn't matter how young I am, how old I am, my gender, none of that matters. The scripture taught us is that in Christ, there is no more distinction between people. Mm -hmm. There's no more Jew or Gentile. There's no more young. There's no more old. There's no more gender. There's no more male or female. That's what the scripture says. What is he telling us to do? What is he saying? Anybody who responds to Jesus doesn't matter who you are. You should get the same result because it's the same Jesus. He did what he did for the whosoever. I'm the whosoever. Right. So what am I saying? Can I push it a little further? Since we're right here, we're in, 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 in St. Pete. Can I push it a little further? What am I saying? What I'm, I, I'm saying is. When all of us respond to Jesus, we all have a common outcome. If you're living your life responding to the same, and if, to Jesus, and I'm living my life responding to Jesus, then the outcome of that should be the same. The outcome is the same. The outcome is the same. What you get from responding to Jesus, when I respond to Jesus, it's the same. So now after you've responded to Jesus, you can confidently tell somebody else that if you just respond to Jesus, you, you, you can live this life. You can be just as free. You can have just as much hope because all I'm doing is responding to Jesus. I haven't added anything to it. See, I can go to someone who's coming into the fold and tell that person, all you got to do is respond to Jesus. It's not it's not it's not. Um, 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 what you say, what's the word when you've been working for a company for a long time? Tenure? It just ain't nothing about no tenure, you know? It doesn't have nothing to do with it. It ain't because I've been a I've been, um, member of the church longer. It's not based on, on our giving. It's just responding to Jesus. Amen. The freedom and the liberty that I live in is because I responded to Jesus. The hope that I have for the future is because I responded to Jesus. Amen. Ain't because I memorized scripture. See, the problem that Jesus had with the Pharisees, he says, you're loading these people up. You're loading these people down with all of this extra stuff. You got them coming to what's supposed to be the house of prayer and they got to pay, pay for sacrifice and pay for all of this stuff. You're loading them down with things that is based on your tradition and it has nothing to do with me. 
And Jesus was trying to remove all the mess and get people back to just responding to Jesus. That's the whole point of the gospel. That's why when he gave his life and when he was up on that cross and he said it is, it is finished. You know, one of the first things that happened after he said it is finished, after he uttered those words on that cross, it is finished. The scripture says and the veil in the temple was rent. What does that mean? That once what? What once separated you from the presence of God was removed. It's the purpose of him coming to remove everything that separates you from me. I'm moving it out of the way. No more religion, no more works, none of this stuff. All of this mess, we've added all of this stuff. He's like, get it out of the way. I believe Jesus went in that temple and turned the tables over because they were in the way. It's impeding people's progress to me. Move it out of the way. Move it out of the way. The centurion didn't have nothing but Jesus. Nothing but Jesus. The Seraphonician, she had nothing but Jesus. The woman with the issue had nothing but Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. It's like it's, it's, it's hidden in plain sight. It's right there. All three. None of them were Jews. They're all Gentiles. Amen. Meaning I, ain't, I don't even know your customs. I don't even know the custom. I don't even know the history. I don't even know the proper protocol. I don't know none of that. All I know is I got an issue and I heard about this man named Jesus. That's all I know. Amen. Glory to God. It's time to get back to Jesus. Yes. What is your faith pointing to? What is your faith pointing to? Some people say they have faith. What they really have is favorable conditions. Your conditions were just right for you to do that. Yeah. You say that's your faith. And that's not an issue. I mean, you know, um, my wife and I, um, well, we got married and moved into a new house and there were things that, you know, hearing from God and praying and, and, and doing what he told us to do and all of that, that added up to it. But the truth is we had the credit. We had good credit and we had some money for a down payment. And we got a house. Sometimes what, what, I'm, what people have labeled as faith is really favorable conditions. You had money to buy that car. Why am I making the distinction? Because, listen, if, you, if, you, if we associate those things with faith, is that universal? Is that universal? Is that, does that apply to me and the next person and the next person and the next person? Can everybody do that? Just call it what it is. Yeah. <laughs> call it what it is. Faith responding to Jesus should produce same results. Right. No matter who it is in front of me, I should be able to put Jesus before them. They respond to Jesus and get the same results. This is what I'm saying. Right? Common faith is faith in favorable conditions. Common faith is faith in favorable conditions. What we want to live in is uncommon faith. Check this out. Common faith is faith in favorable conditions. So we have people who, who, we've, who are, you're, you're just waiting on the favorable conditions. You're waiting on the conditions to be right. Do you hear what I'm saying? You're waiting on the conditions to, to be right. You're waiting on the situation to be comfortable is really what you're doing, is really what's happening. Amen. You understand that? Mm -hmm. Your trust and reliance is on favorable conditions. Your trust and reliance is on everything faring well. Your trust and reliance is on, I hope the sun is out. I hope it's not raining, not cloudy. That's the indication that I can move forward. Everything looks good. Come on now. I, I, you know, you're waiting on, oh, my money's lined up. I can do the thing that God put in my heart to do because my money's lined up. There's a place for budgeting and, and having your finances in order, but let's call it what it is. 
I mean, you know, I believe part of the reason that our message is so convoluted is because we label and stuff something that is really not. There's a place for stewardship. And if God has called you to something, then there's a place for you to be a good steward. But faith is you responding to Jesus. Faith is even if the situation isn't comfortable, I'm still believing that I can receive what he wanted for me to receive. Faith is even if the even if it doesn't look favorable, I'm still believing in good outcome, even in an unfavorable situation. I'm still believing for this to turn out good for me because I'm responding to Jesus. I can have enemies all around me, but I'm going to come out of this on top. Because I'm responding to Jesus. Oh, that's good right there. Um, Yeah, mm. Yeah, it is. We see this happening with the story of Peter. Y'all know Peter. Remember Peter walked in the water? Look at Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14 started at verse number 22. I'm going to read this from the Amplified Version. What are we saying? What am I saying? Somebody in here, listen, you've been waiting on your your conditions to line up. You've been waiting on things to line up for you in order to take that step forward. (laughs) What God wants to do is not hinged upon the conditions surrounding your situation. What hear what I'm saying? What God is wanting to do is not hinged upon the conditions surrounding your situation. God wants to do something in your life that only he can be accredited to. What God wants to do in your life, you or nobody else is going to be able to say you got that because you had good credit. Mm -mm. God wants to do something that goes beyond your credit score. God wants to do something that goes beyond the amount of money that you got. God wants to do something even when everybody is against you. God is still for you and he wants to show himself Self strong in your life. Here's Peter and the rest of the disciples. In verse 22, it says, Then Jesus directed the disciples. I want you to pay attention to who's orchestrating this situation. Yeah, don't be fooled. This whole situation is orchestrated. Here's Jesus. He directs the disciples to get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent away the crowds. This is happening after Jesus feeds the multitude, right? Jesus feeds the multitude. He sends his disciples away in the boat. He says, y'all go ahead before me. I want to send the I want to send the people away myself. So Jesus says, listen, it's like, OK, picture, I'll bring it into the day for you. You know, you just they just had a good church service. And Jesus says, listen, I want to do the benediction today. Y'all go ahead, get in the boat, go to the other side. I'm going to do the benediction and send the people away. You see that? So the disciples go and they get in the boat. They're going to head to the other side. Jesus is doing a benediction. He's closing down the church service, right? And then it says, and after he had dismissed the multitudes, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. You got that? So, I mean, how much time did it take Jesus to dismiss multitudes of people? I mean, that probably took some time, a considerable amount of time. The disciples are in a boat. They're in the water. They're going to the other side. Jesus has just dismissed a multitude of people, and he doesn't even speed up to try to catch up with them. He decides that after dismissing all these people, I'm going to go and pray. So Jesus goes up into the hills to pray. And when it was evening... He was still there. He's in no hurry. He's not in a hurry. I'm sure the disciples waiting on him. I don't know about you, but I know some people, and I wish I could go back and find them people who at the beginning of my Christian life painted the picture like everything was going to be real rosy. I just want to go and Love on them. Why you set me up like that? 
Have you ever been anxious for God to show up in your life? Can anybody relate to that? Yeah. It's like, God, if you're going to show up, like, this is the time. <laughs> it's like, right now. <laughs> like, I'm looking for you. Can you imagine how the disciples felt in that boat? I mean, they've been rolling with Jesus. They just saw something that blew their mind. They saw this man feed over 5,000 people with two fish, five loaves. It's like, bro, we need you all the time. <laughs> if you could do that, we need you. Could you imagine how they felt when he said, listen, I want y'all to go in the boat. Go on. I'll catch up with you. They walking backwards like, you sure, Jesus? We come with you, man. We can come with you, you know? I don't know if, I don't know if you've had the experience yet, but I pray that it's coming. I don't know if you've had the experience in your life yet when you, you know, that is the, I believe everybody needs to have that experience where the, the moment you realize that you don't want to do nothing without God. I, I pray that happened to you. I pray that you have an experience where you realize, I mean, you just, it just like comes on you where you realize that I, I, I don't want to do nothing without him. And I believe that the disciples had had experiences like that. So here they are in a moment where Jesus is telling them, y'all go forward. I'm going to wrap things up right here. And the disciples are like, I don't want to do nothing without you. But at your word, we'll get in the boat. They get in the boat. They anxious, y'all. I know they are because they're on that water and they're looking at the shore and they're looking at the water and they're looking at the shore and they're looking at the water and they're noticing that the distance between the shore and the water is growing. And Jesus ain't came yet, y'all. What we going to do? Jesus ain't came yet. And I bet you Peter was driving the boat because you know how Peter is. And they the other disciples telling Peter, don't you want to wait for Jesus? We... And we done got out here too far now, man. Come on now. Jesus ain't even in now kind of hurry. I don't know about you, but there have been some situations where I wish God was in a hurry, but he wasn't in a hurry. He decided to go up into the hills and pray. And evening has come. Ooh, shoot. Evening has come. Not sunshine. Evenings come. Oh, man. I don't smell no flowers. I don't hear no birds. Evening has come. It's dark. Evening has come. Evening has come. All of us in here have had an evening. Sun ain't shining today. It's evening. In real life, the evening only supposed to last, what, about 12 hours maybe? But God, dog, I've been in some seasons that just seemed like one evening after another evening. Evening has come. And Jesus ain't close to me. Don't seem like it. <laughs> Anybody ever been there? It's like evening time in my life. And I don't know where God is. It's evening time, and I don't know where Jesus is. I don't shout it out. I don't pray it. But I ain't hearing them say nothing, and it is evening. It says evening time came. The disciples are out there on that water. And not only that, I mean, I can understand if they was on the water. Like, a few days ago, I had the opportunity to stay somewhere, and uh, there was a nice lake in the back where we stayed. It was beautiful. It was nice and calm. Ain't nothing like calm waters. I mean, sitting next to some calm waters is real peaceful. You know, like perfect place to just hear from God. Perfect place to hear nothing. Perfect place to just sit and meditate on some things. But these boys were not in that situation. Mm -mm. Want nothing peaceful about where they were. Look what it says, 24. But the boat was by this time out on the sea, many furlongs. It was a distance away from the shore. And check this out. Beaten and tossed by the waves, for the wind was against them. The wind was against them. The wind was against them. Such poetic language. I mean, the wind was against them. It was like the conditions were not for them. The conditions were not favorable. This wasn't no nice row 
row, row your boat. No, this is, this is trouble on the waters. My goodness. Here it is, evening time. The water is rocky. The winds are blowing. And Jesus is nowhere to be found. This is not good. This is not a good situation. Do you understand that? This is not a good situation. But I want to remind you. And, and if I were in the boat, knowing what I know now, I'll, I think I would have been able to give an encouraging word to the disciples because I know they weren't thinking about this in the moment. One thing they didn't think about. Oh, my goodness. If they would have thought about this, they would have been all right. But I know they didn't think about this because I see what happened. If they would have if, if, if they see sometimes in your life, you need to remember who sent you to where you Amen. are. Even if it's evening, even if the wind is blowing, even if the water is choppy, I think you'd have some peace if you look back and remembered who sent you this way. I don't know. I've, I've had some situations in my life and it, it wasn't all that comfortable. But I had to remember who sent me here. And just knowing who sent me here made everything all right. Because I'm not responding to conditions, I'm responding to Jesus. And even in the storm, Jesus is still Jesus. The conditions weren't favorable. Verse 26 says, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and they said, it is a ghost. And they screamed out with fright. How many times in our lives have we dismissed what God was doing because what we saw wasn't favorable? How many times in our life has we, have we dismissed where God was working? God had orchestrated a whole situation for you, but you dismissed it because it didn't look favorable. How often do we dismiss a move of God, God doing something uncommon in our lives because it's not familiar? It's not what we're used to. Oh, my goodness. I think many of us, if we were Elijah, Elijah got fed by ravens, by a dried up brook. Many of us would have missed that meal. If I see some birds flying at me, I'm running. I ain't, I ain't letting them feed me. And I would have missed a miracle because this is not common. This is not familiar. How often in our lives do we dismiss what God is doing because it's not, the situation is not favorable? This don't seem right. See, we put God in the box. Like, only, if God's going to do something, it's got to be sunshine. I need to hear some birds singing. Right. Those are, those, those are the indications that we use to prove that it's God. This has got to be favorable. If God is for me, everybody should be smiling up in here. If, they, if God is in this, I know God don't want me to say nothing up in this board meeting. Look how everybody looking at me. If God wanted me to say something, he'd have put some smiles on some people's faces. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It can't be God up in here. This is this not favorable. These conditions are against me. Oh, man. And we miss what God wants to do because we really are relying on the conditions to be favorable. We miss what God is wanting to do because we're really relying on things to be common, things to be familiar. How many times have we dismissed what God was doing because it wasn't favorable? How many times have we dismissed what God was doing because what we saw wasn't familiar. In those circumstances, who or what is it that we're really trusting in? Listen, does your situation change when you see it change? 
Or does your situation change when you see him in your situation? Does the way that you define a moment, is that more impacted by the situations and the circumstances surrounding that event? Or, or are you defining it because you know Jesus is in it? Look at verse 27. But instantly he spoke to them saying, take courage. I am. Stop being afraid. Jesus says, take courage. I am. And this wasn't the first time he told him that he was the I am. This is a reminder. So he's saying that he's saying it in his reminder tone. Like, I am. You know, like you told somebody and told you. What you being afraid for? I am. Hello, I am. I am. What is he saying in that moment? What was Jesus saying? He's saying, remember, I am. Remember, look, you can't put me in a box built from your familiarity because I am. You can't box me into what you used to because I am, I am doesn't fit in your box. If I'm the I am God, that means that I am what you're used to and I am what you're not used to. If I'm the I am God, that means I am common and I am very uncommon all at the same time. If I'm the I am God, that means that I'm, I'm there when you say it's on time, but I am also there when you think it's not good timing. I am. Don't box me in. I am. I am. I am. I can show up when it's favorable, but I am the God that shows up when it's unfavorable. I am that same God. I am. He says, listen, I know this situation ain't comfortable. I know that's not what you're familiar with, but hey, hey, I am. Remember, I am. Don't put me out of this situation. Don't dismiss me from this situation because I am. God can use uncomfortable situations to move you where he wants you to be. If you were, you know, this is the analogy that I like to use. You know, if you're one of them people who like to, you like to rely on the sidewall of the swimming pool. I'm good right here on the sidewall. As long as I'm by the wall, it's okay. But just to help you identify where your trust is, God will allow the sidewall to be removed. Just to allow you to see where your trust is. Peter walked on the water because he had faith in who he was walking to. Not in the conditions he was walking in. Peter walked on water because he was responding to the who he was walking to. He wasn't responding to the conditions he was walking in. We often stop the uncommon experience from happening because we focus more on what's happening than who orchestrated what's happening. Look at verse 28. It says, and Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on this water. I love the word choice right there. Notice that Peter didn't say, Lord, if it's you, I'm coming on this water. No, he says, Lord, if it's you, command me. Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Lord, if it is you. See, at this point, Peter is looking beyond the unfamiliarity of the situation. At this point, Peter is not focusing on the wind, the waves, the sky. None of the uncommon is is interfering with his focus. 
Peter is looking past the discomfort of the circumstance. Peter is focusing in on who he knows. Listen, Peter is saying on the strength of this relationship and on the authority of your word, I will step out and walk on this water on the strength of this relationship and the authority of your word, I will step out and walk on this water. There are some uncommon things about to take place in our lives. Hear what I'm saying. Hear what I'm saying. There's some uncommon things about to take place in your life. Don't miss it because it's not familiar. Don't miss it because it's uncomfortable. There are some uncommon things about to take place in your life, and it's going to happen on the strength of your relationship with him and on the authority of the word spoken over you. Oh, my goodness. I'll preach this same message again next Sunday just so you can get the parts that you missed today. There's some uncommon things about to happen in your life on the strength of your relationship with him and on the authority of his word to you. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and he came toward Jesus. But when he perceived and felt the strong wind, When he considered the conditions, he was frightened. And as he began to seek, he cried out, Lord, save me from death. See, at this point, Peter is responding to the conditions and not to Jesus. At this point, Peter's actions are a reflection of the conditions and not Jesus. At what point in your life are you responding to the conditions surrounding you instead of Jesus and the work he finished for you? In what places of your life are you responding to the conditions surrounding you instead of the work that Jesus finished for you? Verse 31 says, instantly Jesus reached out his hand and called him and held him, saying to him, look what he said, O you of little faith. Why did you doubt? O you of little reliance on me. O you of little trust in me. Why did you doubt? Jesus asked Peter a question. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? It's not a rhetorical question. I believe Jesus wanted an answer. He at least wanted Peter to think of the answer. Why did you doubt? I mean, think about it, man. You was walking on the water. You did what was necessary to walk on the water. Whatever it took to walk on the water, you did it. You were walking on the water. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Have you ever witnessed somebody doing the thing? I mean, they were doing their thing. And then for whatever reason, they decided to make some adjustments. And then they stopped doing the thing. And it's like, why you stop doing? You were doing it. Why did you stop doing what it took to do it. That's what Jesus is like. You were doing it. Why did you stop doing what it took to do it? Oh, my goodness. You were doing it. Oh, all of y'all been doing it. You born again? You were doing it. You were doing it. I'm not, I'm going to keep on going. I'm so ready to get to the, the, the banger. But I'm going to keep on going. Oh, goodness, it's good. (laughs) Jesus asked Peter, why did you doubt? You started in faith. Why did you end in doubt? Jesus offers Peter the opportunity to do some self-reflection. It's so interesting to me that nobody nobody celebrated Peter walking on the water. (laughs) God dang, the man did walk on the water. He ain't getting not one out of boy, not one pat on the back for walking on the water. It's like that wasn't the point. 
I mean, as exciting as walking on the water is, you were walking on the water, then you did something to stop. That's what I'm trying to figure out, right? All the attention goes to why did you doubt? Like you was doing it, you was doing it. I mean, you was gone, boy. Why'd you stop? It's like you were winning, you were winning, man. You was gone, you was in there, you were winning. We winning, we winning, we winning, we winning, we winning. Why'd you stop? It's like watching your favorite sports team, watching your favorite football team. They start off with a great game plan. I mean, they're going. They're putting points on the board. The defense working. Everything's going. And then, man, why you stop the game plan, man? Why did you stop? What happened? Right? Why did you stop becomes the focus, right? When you identify his reason for sinking, you also identify his reason for walking in the first place. Oh, it's the same for me and you. You think I'm talking about Peter? I ain't talking about Peter. I'm talking about you. (laughs) This is me and you. When you identify your reason for sinking, you also can put your finger on the reason that you're walking from the beginning. The faith that started you is good enough to keep you. The faith that you began with is the faith you need to keep on. Uh, Deacon Kevin used to say, I'm rolling with the girl who brought me. We'd be on a, on a work site getting ready to do some work and, um, you know, the opportunity to pull out a new tool or something, you know. And at that time, a lot of people want to pull out their fancy, new, shiny, brand new knife. And his response was, it would be, no, nah, I'm just going to roll with the girl who brought me. <laughs> what does that mean? Mm-hmm. No, man, we got history right here. That's right. That's right. We got success after success after success. Ain't no need to try nothing new. Right. Uh-uh, this, this is working. And I'm telling you, the faith that you started with is good enough to keep you. Amen. When you believe God for uncommon results, here we go. When it comes to uncommon results, when it came, comes to this, you know, my first response is, you know, what do I need to do? What do I need to do to walk in the uncommon? What do I need to do to get the, the big thing? What do I need to do to make the dream come true? What do I need to do? And the Holy Spirit responded to me. He said, no, man, it's not about what you need to do. It's about what Jesus already did. What did Jesus do so that I can walk in victory? What did Jesus do so that I can have an abundant life? What did Jesus already do so that I can have peace in this situation? What did Jesus do so I can be the head and not the tail? What did Jesus do so I can win going in and win going out? What did Jesus already do? It's not about what I can add to it. It's about what he already did. My faith is pointed to him. Uncommon faith points back at Jesus. We're free because of what Jesus finished. We're healed because of what Jesus finished. We prosper because of what Jesus finished. Everything points back to Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Just Jesus. Jesus has done enough. Jesus has done enough. Jesus is enough. Jesus has done enough. Listen, this is a point that I want to make to you. The faith that started you is good enough to keep you. Check this out. The same thing that happened to Jesus happens, I mean, same thing that happened to Peter happens to us. And this is where it applies to us just so practically. This is where it applies to us so practically. Practically, Your water walking moment happened. Many of us, we're looking for it. We're looking for that water walking moment. Your water walking moment happened the day you got saved. Listen, the greatest miracle in your life you have already witnessed and experienced in your born again self, your renewed, recreated, all the evidence that you have to point that you are new, you're not who you used to be. That's greater than any miracle we read about in the Bible. That's greater. Your born again self is greater than the water, the Red Sea splitting. You being a new creature is greater than the ravens feeding the prophet. 
You, your newness, this new life that you walk in is the greatest miracle. That was your water walking moment. The faith that started you is good enough to keep you. The only thing that we've learned from religion is how to add stuff to it. And since that moment of great faith, we just been trying to add stuff to it. So at the beginning, all you had was Jesus. You ain't know nothing else. I ain't know no scripture when I got saved. I ain't ain't know the church protocol. I had no title on my name. It was me and Jesus in a driveway on a hot summer day. And I was 15 years old trying to figure out my life. And all I had was Jesus. And I stepped out of a boat and I walked on the water. Then at some point, somebody told me that you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to. And for the rest of my life, I've been trying to get back to walking on the water. And all my prayers have been, Jesus, just show me how to walk on this water. And his response is, he didn't pat me on the back for walking on the water. He said, why'd you doubt? Because what started you was good enough to keep you. You had it going in the beginning. When it was just Jesus, when it was just me and you. That's the answer right there. Just Jesus. Just Jesus. I win in life because it's me and Jesus. I got victory because it's me and Jesus. Just Jesus. I prosper because of what he did. That's all I got. That's all I got. That's all I got. I got peace in any situation because I got Jesus in any situation. Glory to God. Check this out. Last scripture. James chapter 1, verse 4. James chapter 1, verse 4. This is what it says from the Amplified Version. It says, but let endurance and steadfastness and patience. That's the Amplified Version. Pulls all of those words out. Endurance, steadfastness, and patience have full play and do a thorough work so that you may be people perfectly and fully developed with no defects, lacking in nothing. I don't need to add anything to me. I'm lacking in nothing. Notice notice what it says. See, and I've done this. We read the scripture and we think, okay, so I got to I got to get some peace or some patience, I got to get some endurance, I got to get some steadfastness. And then we go on this journey trying to get those things. No, baby, when you got saved, the Spirit of God moved up on the inside of you, and he brought all his luggage with you, and he opened up a suitcase, and guess what was in there? Patience, endurance, steadfastness, everything that you need to live this life godly, you got it. You got it. You got it already. You got it already. So let me give you this statement. This absolute truth. Because Jesus finished the work. I am a finished work. I'm a finished work. I'm a product of his finished work. Everything that I need, he says, I've given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. Everything that I need in order to live this life in victory, I got it. I got it when I got Jesus. That's why Jesus is the bread of life. That's why he's the resurrection. That's why he's the I am. He's my Swiss army knife. He got it all. Amen. Give God some praise in this place. Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. Thank you, Lord. Stand on your feet.
We pray that today's message was a blessing to you. If you would like to help us further expand the vision, simply text the word Give RTM to the number 41444 or visit us online at www.revealingtruth.org. Now remember, Jesus loves you.